The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the twelve, Fear no one. Nothing is concealed that will not be revealed, nor secret that will not be known. What I say to you in the darkness, speak in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Are not two sparrows sold for a small coin? And yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's knowledge. Even all the hairs on your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly Father. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my heavenly Father. The Gospel of the Lord. So this is one of those Gospels that you really need to read the whole chapter in. So I commend you to, when you go home, go look up chapter 10 in Matthew because there's more to it. For instance, this translation says, fear no one. That is, in fact, not what the text says, either in Greek or English. It says, do not fear them. Do not fear them. And the them being referred to is the people in the preceding verses, the people whom Jesus says, you know, will take you before kings and synagogues and persecute you. You know, uh, if they call the head of the house by the name Beelzebub, a name for the, one of the names of the devil, the many names, you know, uh, will they not do the same with the household members? So it's a warning against the persecution that is going to come inevitably in every age. So when you look at the church's history, you know, for 300 years we tried to keep out of the clutches of the pagan Romans because every, you know, they would put us to death for not honoring the pagan gods of Rome. They called us atheists for worshiping another god than was part of the patriotic duty of Roman citizens. We, uh, we know sooner, and of course, then we converted the empire. You know, the empire, the emperor becomes Christian. And we have other problems later on. We have heresies, false teachings that spring up. The Arian heresy, the um, Nestorian heresy, we, you know, all these things which, you know, if I were a, like a newly ordained priest, I'd be telling you about, because that's what I got in my seminary courses. Um, you get Islam coming up in the 600s. You have the uh, barbarian invasions. You have Vikings, you know, coming for plunder and the destruction of churches. You have um, internal squabbles in the church. You have unworthy priests, my heavens, unworthy priests and bishops. Who would have thought of such a thing? If you really want to see horrors, read the, read the story of the clergy in the 900s. That's, that's something. But my point is that Generation after generation, there are new problems, there are new challenges to the Christian faithful, there are new difficulties. You know, in the 1500s, the Ottoman Empire, the Turks had massed half the forces, a million, uh, you know, huge armies and fleets against the Christians. You know, and they were defeated by the Knights of Malta at Malta, the Siege of Malta and Lepanto by the Holy Alliance led by the Dominican, Pope Pius V, you know, and Our Lady of victories, praying the Holy Rosary for us from her place in heaven, encouraging us all to do the same. I could continue. You know, one of the things, when you get to the 1500s, you have the beginning of what I call the modern era. That's how conservative I am, all right? 1500s, we're dealing with modernity. But one of the things that, if you notice this, this even changes things like, you know, look at Council of Trent, this mania for red print in the missile of control, of giving instructions, orders, measuring everything, figuring out the price of everything. This, this concern with the material 
And the need to control, which I think is a characteristic of the modern age, you see beginning there. And it continues. We have the so-called badly named enlightenment, in which the idea was, let's leave off use plan in society according to the gospel. Let's plan according to reason, to principles of enlightened self-interest. And that's what we've been doing for the past 300 years or so. Now, I want to ask you if that makes any sense at all. Should we leave off planning society according to an ethic that calls for, in the gospel, selfless sacrifice, the considering of the other first, the doing of charity at the expense of your own life, offering your, your life as a sacrifice for others, or should we go for the enlightened self-interest, which I simply parse as clever greed? Right? What gives us, you think, will give us a better society? But what have we been using for the past few hundred years? You know, what I'm saying is that the church in every age is challenged. The church in every age finds the world at odds with itself as well as with the church. You know, you look at the Holy Land of the present day, and we have the Israelis on one side and the Arabs on the other side. We have, um, you know, two forces, which neither of which res are, believe in the gospel, hammering each other in the Christians, two, three percent of them, only about the population now, you hammer it in the middle. You know, we find... Uh, you know, persecute, there's, they say there has been more martyrs made in the 21st and, 20, and, 20, and uh, 20th centuries than there have in the whole rest of Christian history. And it's because we stand for different principles, or should, or should. I think you do see it in certain moments. For instance, in the present moment of the evil age, I think we see around us our society's limitations. You know, we see the, uh, the whole business with the pandemic. You know, we see some of you, I do, I'm sure, see government overreach in responding to it. I think you see maybe scientific fuzziness that people, you know, people are concerned about. You know, what those, especially those of us who are trained in the sciences have some questions about the quality of the data sometimes that's being presented. What about the, uh, the amazing thing when you know, we have a political issue that comes forward, not that I'm naming anyone in particular, you know, but all of a sudden COVID distancing doesn't seem to matter to anybody. I've been downtown, you know, at Columbus, where we have, where every, every night we have huge crowds demonstrating and nobody's distancing, very few are wearing masks, et cetera. What I'm saying is the whole, the whole society is nuts, okay? <laughs> all society is nuts and has been nuts for a while, okay? It's inconsistent with itself. You and I, St. Paul says, have been given the mysteries of God to learn. We have been given to know what health and holiness and humanity look like in the person of Jesus Christ. And what I'm suggesting is that this gospel tells us, don't be shy about sharing what you know. Don't be shy about talking about what real life is supposed to be about. The church is not an association. She's not a democracy. She's not even a monarchy. She's a family. She is a family with God our Father, Christ his messenger and, and angel and prophet and king and bridegroom coming to marry, wed the life of God to the human race through holy, the Holy Catholic Church. You are the kin of God. You are the kin of God, and your job is to build the rest of the world into this family. This is what we're called to do. This is why Jesus says, you know, what you hear in the, in the darkness, shout on the rooftops. Share what you know. Bring people in, but do it, not like the world does, yelling and shouting and demanding that you come over to my way of thinking but smooth the path before them. Show them what self-sacrifice looks like, what gentleness and kindness look like. We are not a gentle and kind society, I don't think. But you are all called to this. I'm called to this. We're called to smooth the path to God for the people around us and to show that ourselves. You know, we are to live our family life in ways that are consistent with the gospel. 
You know, fathers are supposed to act like fathers should, show that kind of gentleness, kindness, self-control that we see in the deity himself. You know, is the father a loving and gentle one? Read the parable of the prodigal son if you want to see what a father should look like. You know, because it's different from most of us, how we would react if we were told by our kid, basically, Dad, I can't wait for you to die. Give me what's coming to me right now. The temptation is to do that, right? In a way different from the, well, the scripture. But in fact, we are called to live all in this pattern of Jesus Christ. The heart of Christ, the heart of Mary, show us what it is to live with the Savior and to follow the Savior with all our hearts as Mary does. And in these two figures, we are given a pattern of life to live ourselves and to teach. And the best sermon, of course, we give is by our own actions, you know? And, uh, you know, he is, Jesus, St. Paul says, is the new Adam, the heavenly Adam, the Adam who comes with a different, to shape humanity differently, and differently from the old Adam, you know? Uh, he talked about Adam's sin in the second reading, right? What was that sin? Do you remember what Adam said to the devil? In the temptation in the garden? Of course you don't. He didn't say a thing. That was the problem. He was given the commandment. He was given the word of God to face down the devil. What did he say? Absolutely nothing. Have you ever met the kind of guy who leaves religious conversations and instruction to the wife? Just saying. I love that expression the kids have, you know. Just saying, I can say. But my point is, my point is, we're called to more. And fathers are asked to show what, um, what family life is about by their own example, and that will be by self-sacrifice. That's the kind of love we're called to love with. We live in a society which is all about individual rights. It's about the rights of husband against wife in, in marriage law, about children against parents and parents against children. It's about the right to get what you want out of a marriage or, or close close the books, walk away, pay damages. That is not the gospel. The gospel is where, where Christ lays down his life for holy church, where our blessed Mary, the mother of Christians, you know, suffers a kind of spiritual death at the cross, you know, a, a desolation. She participates in that desolation that her son's heart feels and through this, holy labor becomes mother of many by her suffering. And if you understand what it is to be a husband and a wife and a mother and father, you'll know that that involves suffering. It's got to involve building a family sacrifice. And this is what you and I are called to, each according to our own shape of the vocations we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we come to meditate on this gospel, please, you know, understand what we are called to. We are called to be a different kind of people than the world outside. We are called to live in the spirit of self-sacrifice and a following of Jesus in his words and deeds as we see reflected in the life of our Blessed Lady. We see this in the Rosary Mysteries. We see this in the passages of Scripture. We see this made real again in the lives of all the saints for the past 2,000 years, nay, for the past 4,000 years, if you include the patriarchs and prophets who followed God in the old dispensation. So as we continue with our Mass, let's ask the Lord to open our hearts to this new reality, to recreate us over, under, beneath the bright cloud of the Holy Spirit that has overshadowed us as a church since Pentecost, and to open our hearts with that fire to shape us as missionary disciples, as the Holy Father likes to call us, to shape us as apostles, as prophets, those who do and speak the will of God to the world and each other, and live in this love of Jesus Christ that has transformed the world, spawned cultures, renewed the world in many ages, and in the present evil age, we are called to bear as fire to light the darkness outside.